Here the mother maid had brought sweet spice unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. They said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were afraid. And he said to them, Be not afraid, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. There you shall see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher for they, were, they trembled and were amazed. Neither did they say anything to anyone for they were afraid. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom He had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with Him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that He was alive and had been seen of her, they did not believe. Would you bow with me please for the remainder part of the service? Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for this time that you've given us, your multiplied blessings upon our life. Lord, we ask that your divine, perfect will would be done in this service, that your word would go forth with power, meet every need according to your mighty working power. Do that which is pleasing in your sight. Walk among us, visit us. Lord, I pray that you would anoint me to preach your word and anoint the hearers, open our eyes spiritually and our ears spiritually, that we might have eyes to see and ears to hear, that your word accomplish its purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. The resurrection, well at first, we're having revival starting Thursday. And I got, I got to casting in my mind and praying what would be a good message for preparation for the revival. And I remember when I, re, when I preached revivals as evangelist, I had a card that said, and preached Jesus to him. That's what my card said. Where Philip got up in the chariot, up in the wagon with the Ethiopian eunuch, and he'd been reading Isaiah 53, and he said, Is Isaiah writing about himself or somebody else? And it says he got up in the wagon and preached Jesus to him. So I thought, what better topic? The resurrection of the eternal God-man. The resurrection of the eternal God-man. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has been attacked by the devil more than any other doctrine. Because he knows that when it is believed by a person, the chance of dragging that person into hell is forever lost. Because he knows he's lost his hope. But from the time of the resurrection, there have been continual attempts to try to discredit it as having happened. Even right the day of the resurrection, in Matthew the 28th chapter, the elders and the scribes and the, of the Pharisees, the chief priests, gave money to the Roman soldiers and told them to lie and say that his disciples came, you fell asleep and his disciples came and stole him away. And then they said, don't worry, we'll cover for you with Pilate so you won't get into trouble. And then the scripture says, the Jews believe it to this day. But when the power of the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the 120 in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. The Bible says in Acts 4.33, with great power, the apostles gave witness to what? The resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great <coughs> grace was upon them all. The power of their witness of the fact that Jesus had risen again 
caused it to go from 11 disciples to the 120, then to 3,000, and then to 5,000, and then it spread across the known world. Why? Because they knew that they'd seen Jesus, that He was alive, and that He said He'd be with them forever, that He would never leave them or forsake them. And within a very few years, even though Christ's followers were murdered, they were persecuted, they were tortured, they were tarred, they were burned at the stake, they were eaten by lions, whatever happened, Christianity had spread across the entire Roman Empire. And by 313 AD, the Edict of Milan said that Christians could no longer be persecuted for their faith. And by 380 AD, Christianity was the officially recognized religion of the Roman Empire. And the reason for this rapid rise was because the apostles had seen the Lord Jesus, the risen Christ, and they knew that He was with them in great power. And this knowledge caused Christians to be able to go to their death praising God. Put into the, to the uh, gladiatorial uh, arena, eaten by lions and bears, and put in uh, bags and mauled by dogs and torn apart by horses. They would go praising God and asking God to forgive their tormentors and their persecutors. Where did that great power come from? It came from the resurrected Christ, the eternal God-man. And the Christian's power still comes from that same source today. God-man. Totally unique in the universe. No one ever has been or ever will be like Him. Fully God and fully man. Not half God and half man, but totally man and totally God. The hypostatic union, that's called in theological terms. But let's look at the eternal God-man. He was the eternal God-man in His birth. He was grew in the womb of His mother Mary. He was born just as any other babe. But yet the angels praised Him and said, Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Because God has come in the form of a man. And the shepherds came and worshipped Him. At 12 years old in the temple, he was fully God and fully man. He was a boy. He was 12. His mom and Joseph lost, said, where is he? They come back from the Passover and they couldn't find him. Let's go back and find him. His mother knew where to go. She went to the temple. They found Jesus there. Yes, he was a boy. But the Bible says he was asking questions and being asked questions. And they were amazed at his wisdom. His mom said, son, why have you worried me and your father so? He said, Mom, I have to be about my father's business. He knew he was fully God. And then, he was. He, let's go ahead in his life. Let's look at him in the garden of Gethsemane. In Luke 22, 44, Jesus prayed, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. The Bible says, in being in great agony, he prayed the more earnestly. And his sweat became, as it were, great drops of blood dropping down to the ground. Christ in his human nature knew hunger. He knew thirst. He knew about being tired. He felt anxiety. He felt depression. He felt being separated, being rejected by his friends. He was in great stress in that garden. He was a man in that garden. His stress and prayer was so great that this symptom that we call hematotrodosis, which it, it means under great stress, the capillaries right under the skin burst and mingle with your sweat, and your sweat became, became bloody sweat. He said in Matthew 26, 38, his distress about what he had to face had brought him to the threshold of death. He said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Yes, he was truly a man in the garden. But in that garden he also prayed. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Matthew 26, verse 39. As God, his holy nature shrank from that symbolic cup that he was going to have to drink. In that cup he looked into it and he saw all the evil, degrading, unnatural, sinful acts that man had ever committed or would commit. And he knew that what drinking the cup metaphorically meant was that he was going to have to take all that sin upon himself. And his holy nature shrank from it. 
His human nature shrank from it. But as the eternal God, He knew, He prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son that Your Son may glorify You. Since You have given Him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all those You have given Me. And this is life eternal that they may know You and the only, the, uh, You the only true God and Jesus Christ whom You have sent. John 17. Verses 1 through 3. He knew that He was the eternal God and was going to give His life to give eternal life to all those who through grace and mercy would trust Him as Savior. In asking that the cup be taken away, He revealed His human will. By submitting His human will to the Father, Christ revealed His divine will that He was one with the Father. In the garden, he was eternally God and eternally man. He was the eternal God-man in His suffering and in His passion. At His trials before Annas and Caiaphas, He suffered as a man. When the officers of the Sanhedrin struck Him at John 18.22 and spat in His face and slapped Him and struck Him again and again, Matthew 26.66, Isaiah looked down through the tunnel of time 700 years before and saw Him. Jesus knew human suffering. When He was before Pilate, He suffered as a man. We read that Pilate had Him whipped and let the soldiers abuse Him by making a crown of thorns and thrusting it down on His head. Those long thorns pushed down into His scalp. They put a purple robe on Him and mocked Him. John 19, verses 1-3. through 3. These blows left bruises and contusions and blood and brought facial swelling, probably split his lip, but brazens and bleeding. Isaiah said, when we should see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. Pilate then had Jesus whipped. The blows of the whip laid on by the hands of those expert torturers, that's all they did mostly, was learn how to whip someone to the point of death, almost death. As the blows started up, they eventually became faster and harder, cutting deep into the skin tissues. The blood would first lose from the capillaries and the veins just under the skin, and then arterial bleeding would begin from the vessels underlying the muscles. His back was ripped to shreds. This fulfills another prophecy of Isaiah. He says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Isaiah 50, verse 6. Then in the passage we see there's another attempt on Pilate's part to see if Jesus could still be set free. In that famous scene, he brings out Jesus, the crown of thorns on his head, beaten, face probably swelled and bloody, a terrible, disfigured looking person. And he said, Eke homo in Latin, which means, Behold the man. He was a man in his passion and suffering. But even in his passion and suffering, he remained who he was a man, but he was also God. When the high priest of the Jews plainly asked him, are you the Christ, the Son of God, the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Mark 14, 62. He spoke as very God of very God. When Jesus the betrayer, when Judas the betrayer, I'm sorry, when Judas the betrayer came with the officers of the Sanhedrin to arrest him in the garden and said they were seeking of Jesus of Nazareth, he said, I am he. And as soon as he said, I am he, the scripture says, they went backward and fell down to the ground. John 18, verse 6. The power of his word, when he spoke as God, saying, I am, knocked him down to the ground. When Pilate spoke to him a second time, 
Pilate was curious about what kind of person he was dealing with. And he, he said, don't you know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? John 19, verse 10. Jesus answered him as God. He said, you can have no power over me at all unless it has been given you from above. John 19, 11. He was God in His suffering and His passion. He was the eternal God-man in His crucifixion and in His death. The Gospels all tell, all the Gospels tell of the incredible suffering that Jesus went through when He was crucified. They made Him carry His cross beam to Calvary. And as the rough wood of the beam gouged into His already lacerated and torn skin and shoulder and back, it caused already more pain and more bleeding. He felt pain like any man would. The weight of the crossbeam made him stumble and fall. And the scripture says that a North African man named Simon of Cyrene, almost surely a black man, was made to carry the cross with Jesus following behind to Calvary. Matthew 27, 32. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Master, let us never forget what you went through to buy our salvation, Master. The nails that the Romans used were five to seven inches long. They laid the hands out on the cross beams and they nailed them through in his hand or his wrist, which the hand, wrist is considered part of the hand in, physio uh, in, uh, in physiology, in anatomy. And then they nail it through. And then they bend over the back of the nail. So when the prisoner struggles trying to get free, they can't get their hands loose. The feet were placed one on top of the other and put on a platform, a plenum. And then they were also nailed to the cross, again causing tremendous pain and more bleeding. The cross was then raised up over the hole that had been dug for it, and it was dropped down in the hole with a thud, and he would shake on the cross. You can imagine the surge of pain that went through his body. Oh, Jesus. But he was also God in his crucifixion. Woo! Hallelujah to the living God! Hallelujah. Even as he was hanging there, his body experiencing agonizing pain, he was able to look over to the penitent thief and say, Today you will be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. Luke 23, verse 43. As the death of his body was approaching, he cried out, It is finished. John 19, verse 30. He never became the slave of death. Because in his death, death became enslaved to, to him. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. He had paid God's price for sin. He had given the full measure to atone for the sins of all those who by grace and mercy would be able to put their trust in him as their Savior for eternal life. The Father who was pleased to bruise him was now satisfied with the suffering of his soul. Isaiah 53. Verses 10 and 11. Jesus could finally allow His body to die. Remember what He said? No one could took him, take His life from Him. He said He had the power to lay it down and He had the power to lift it back up again. Hallelujah. John 10, verses 17 and 18. Then with His last bit of strength, He filled His lungs with as much air as possible. And with a loud voice he cried out, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Luke 23, verse 46. His death was unique because he was more than just a mere human. Yes, he was totally and completely human, but he was totally and completely God. As the, as the Nicene Creed says, very God, God, man of very man and very God of very God. He was the eternal God-man in His resurrection and His ascension. Listen, when Jesus died on the cross, there was no separation between His human nature and His divine nature. Christ was just as much a human being after the resurrection 
as he was before the resurrection. He still had a physical human body. Now it was changed. It was transformed. It had properties, amazing properties that we can understand. But he was, at the resurrection, Christ's divine nature, and remember friends, he had a human soul and a human spirit. Christ's divine nature, his human soul and human spirit were joined to the same physical body that died on the cross. And his physical body was made immortal and incorruptible. After the resurrection, his closest followers, including his apostles, we read it in our text, did not believe that he was really a man. Wayne Grudem in his book, Bible Doctrine, says there are at least ten pieces of evidence in the New Testament showing that Jesus had a physical human body after the resurrection. I'll read all of them. Matthew 28, 9, the disciples took hold of his feet. Luke 24, 30, he took bread and broke it. John 20, 15, Magdalene, Mary Magdalene thought he was a gardener. John 26, 20, 27, he invited Thomas to touch his wounds. He explicitly said in Luke 24, 39, see my hands and feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones like you see me have. Woo! Hallelujah to the lift. Can, is that a mind blower or what? Hey, the army back to the 60s. That's a, that, that blows my mind. But he was not only a man, he was also the eternal God after his resurrection. Amen. He was able to open the disciples' minds that they might understand the scriptures, Luke 24, 45. He was miraculously able to appear in the midst of the disciples with the doors being closed and go into the room, the locked room that they were in, Luke 24, 36 and John 20, 26. As God, He ascended bodily in a human body, body up into heaven, out of their sight, Luke 24, 51 and Acts 1, verse 9. Listen, but we must remember that he arose and ascended in a perfected physical body. And now as God and man, the Bible says he's sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 1 verse 3. The resurrection of Jesus is God's proof that his death was completely successful in blotting out the sins of his people and removing the wrath of God from them. Paul writes to the Philippians to make this point. Christ, as a man, was obedient unto the point of death. Therefore, that means, or because of this, God has highly exalted Him and gave, given Him a name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, of things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 and following. What did he say in Revelation? I love that scene in Revelation. I won't quote the whole thing. But John saw him in Revelation when he was on the Isle of Patmos. And what he saw scared him half to death. The glory and the awesomeness of what he saw. The Bible says he fell at his feet as a dead man. I love this part. Then John says, Then he laid his right hand on me and said, John, don't be scared. That's why I, the way I say it. The country's wife. Don't be scared. It's me. It's Jesus. I am he who is dead and now lives and behold am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Woo! Hallelujah. Oh, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Just prior to raising Lazarus from the dead, he said to his sister Martha, to Lazarus' sister Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who lives and believes in me shall never die. Isn't that strange? Every human being dies. What Jesus means shall never die. It means the soul and spirit will never die. And it says... Though a person dies, he shall live. 
And he who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he said, do you believe this? And that's the same question he's asking today. Whether you're here, whether you're listening on YouTube or Facebook or wherever. It's the same question today. Do you believe? That's the ultimate question. Ron Rose, I have a book of his called Christ Before the Manger. And he said this. Humankind's redemption was completely dependent upon the human divine union in Christ. If Christ the Redeemer had been only God, He could not have died because God cannot die. It was only as a man that Christ could represent humanity and die as a man. As God, however, Christ's death had the infinite value sufficient Provide redemption for the sins of all who by grace would believe in Him. End quote. The question now remains, what will you or I do when faced with the fact of His resurrection? Christ proved who He said He was by the resurrection. He proved He was the eternal God-man. Paul says in Romans 8, that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead shall also make your mortal bodies alive. Romans 8 verse 11. Paul summed it up. If Christ is not raised, our preaching is empty. And your faith is empty. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you're still in your sins. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 14, 16, and 17. But I'm here to tell you today that Christ did rise again as the eternal God-man. He did ascend into heaven as the eternal God-man. And He is coming back to this earth again as the eternal God-man. In Acts the first chapter when He was ascending up into heaven, the angels, Luke records the angels saying to the apostles, Why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus Friends, he's not going to send an angel, although the angels are going to blow their trumpets in Revelation 19 and other places. He's not going to send even Michael the archangel or Gabriel the archangel. Moses, or he is going to come himself back to this earth as eternally God and eternally man. Amen. This same Jesus that you saw ascend up in heaven shall so come again in like manner as you have seen him go. Then Jesus said in a prophecy in Matthew the 24th chapter verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Friend, it could be today. It could be today. Or whenever you're listening to this, it could be today that that sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then it said, he says, all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Woo! Hallelujah. In closing, without the resurrection, there would be no Christian religion at all. The Jesus movement would have ended with his death, but friend, it didn't end. 2019 years later, it's still here. We're still here because Jesus is alive. Amen? Amen. All the creeds of Christendom attest to the fact of the truth of the resurrection of the eternal God, man, Jesus Christ the righteous. Untold millions from every race, color, creed, and tongue have believed in that and put their faith in Christ have founded their hope for their eternity on the truth of the resurrection, resurrected eternal God-man, Jesus Christ. I just read the other day that the fastest growing church in the Middle East is in Iran. And it's mostly women. Jesus is appearing to women, Muslim women, in their dreams. Jesus is speaking to them. They don't have a church building. In Iran, it's illegal to be a Christian. They don't have a church, but they have to gather in groups. But there are untold scores of them in Iran. There's a video called Sheep Among Wolves, part one, part two. They are sheep among wolves. Let's pray for our persecuted brethren in China and Korea and Iran and other places. And the question is, 
today. Will you also believe and be saved? Will you also believe and be saved? Would you bow with me, please? Lord, Master, we serve, as the songwriter said, a risen Savior. Woo! He's in the world today. I know that He is living. Whatever men may say, I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him. Woo! Hallelujah. <laughs> He's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. Hallelujah. How do I know this, Lord? Because you live within my heart. Ever since that day in late August of 1976 when you revealed yourself to me in such a wonderful way. Lord, I've been trying to plumb the depths and scale the heights across the chasm of that experience, but I never will. But Lord, we are looking forward to spend an eternity marveling and studying and being fascinated with your multifaceted character. Never finding the end of you, but always being amazed at your glory, at your love. No one loves like you, Lord Jesus. No one can save like you. No one can give mercy like you, Lord Jesus. Give glory to yourself in this word, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Why are we singing?